Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Citizen Time, Recasting the Narrative, featuring Claudia Rankin and Garrett Bradley. I'm Shayla Seabury, the director of the Stadler Center for Poetry and Literary Arts at Bucknell University, and it is my pleasure to host Claudia and Garrett this evening. Tonight's event is a presentation of the Small Literary Arts Center Coalition, or SLAC, comprised of the Boutel Day Poetry Center at Smith College, the Rose O'Neill Literary House at Washington College, and the Stadler Center at Bucknell. One of the coalition's missions is to bring major artists like these two individuals to our three institutions. At Bucknell, we are grateful for the additional support for this and related programs from the Campus Theater, the Tuesday Film Series, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, the Grio Institute for the Study of Black Lives and Cultures, the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Gender, and the Women and Gender Studies Departments. Our two artists who, to paraphrase Claudia's Just Us and American Conversation, live in the archives to see what culture has formed willingly, have engaged with each other's work to, prior to this event and will both share a brief 10 to 15 minute selection as we begin our conversation. So first we'll welcome Garrett Bradley, an artist and Oscar nominated filmmaker who works across narrative, documentary and experimental modes of filmmaking. She is known for her Netflix docu-series, Naomi Osaka, and in 2020, the Smith College alum presented her debut feature length film, Time, which was nominated for numerous awards, earning her 20, including Best Director at the Sundance Film Festival. The film both collapses and expands upon time as Bradley interweaves archival and present day footage of the enduring love between Sybil Fox and Robert Richardson, who were separated for 20 years following armed robbery convictions, a documentary like no other on the devastation of the carceral system. Today, she'll present AKA, which is the first in a trilogy of films about relationships between women. In this experimental short, developed out of hours long conversations with her protagonists, Bradley explores the relationships between mothers and daughters born into mixed race families or families of the same race with varying skin tones. So please join me in welcoming Garrett Bradley. Hi everybody. <laughs> Happy Mardi Gras to those who are um, watching from afar. Um, it is such an honor and privilege to be here. And I'll just um, say quickly a thank you to everybody who's brought us together. Thank you to those of you who are watching tonight um, and to Claudia, whose work really has been a form of comfort and validation um, and inspiration. I'm really humbled to be here. So thank you. And thank you in advance, Shayla, for, for your moderating tonight. Um, so we were asked, yeah, to share like a small presentation of work before we sort of dive in. And, and I was trying to think about what that could look like. Um, and I, I actually just decided, you know, I, something like came to me, which was this question that Claudia poses um, in Big Little Lies, which is a chapter in the book. And I'm just gonna quote it really quickly. Um, what form of relation can include knowledge of historical dynamics and historical society realities without preventing or interrupting intimacy? Um, I think everything I've done to date and probably continue to do is in an effort to also try to understand that very question. Um, and I think the work itself is sort of a roadmap, um, a journey to try to get to this to this outcome that is where justice and intimacy um, cannot be separated from one another. And I actually don't think that they can be separated from one another. I don't think you can have justice without intimacy. Um, and I think for me, a lot of my work, you know, I delve into that by looking outward and being really invested in what other people think and being really invested in how multiple perspectives um, can sort of be collated to create these additional and third understandings about the world that we live in and how, and how individual um, action is also sometimes reflective of these much 
larger, bigger ideas. Um, I'm also kind of really interested in this idea of um, kind of the messiness of process um, and the humor in it all. Like I actually, I don't know if we'll talk about this tonight, but I think there's so much deep humor in what it means to be to be messy, what it means to be sometimes you know, to be wrong actually as well um, that I'm really interested in. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, without talking too much, I, I wanted to share as Shayla so beautifully introduced um, this film, AKA, which was made in 2019. And I'll just say, you know, briefly that the prompt was actually a desire to make a more traditional adaptation of a lot of these films I was watching, like Pinky, Elia Kazan's film, and both versions of Imitation of Life um, that are dealing with um, this, the intimate relationships between women, between um, Black women and white women, um, between each other, between how they move through the world differently, between how they engage with their, their children differently, um, what their experiences in, in, in the workforce in, in different and similar ways. Um, and in an effort to try to think about like what an adaptation of that narrative might look like in a contemporary sense, I realized I, I really had more questions than answers. And I think, again, I'm just more invested in what other people think. Um, and so I went out to friends and family, um, also strangers, people I found on Craigslist, and ended up working really closely with three groups of mother-daughter kind of couples. And we had collectively um, conversations around how you know, being housed under one roof, you also um, are then moving out into the external world in really distinct ways and how that affects our sense of selves, how that affects family, the notion of family. Um, and the dialogue from those conversations really ended up kind of informing the visual landscape of the work. And you'll hear uh, Lindsay Bowler kind of asking persistently to her mother, are you color struck? Are you color struck? Which is, you know, a term that you know, we Zora Neale Hurston wrote a play in I think 1926 that was also dealing with you know the narrative of colorism. Um, but for me, the word itself kind of struck a really vivid series of images of like rainbows, rainbows, and just spectrums of color, which I find are really difficult. Dealing with color is is something I struggle with a little bit. Um, but for me, it was so kind of intuitive, and again, it came out of the conversation, and so. I guess I just will, will end by saying that something I'm really invested in that goes back to this question around how do we deal with what's real while also maintaining intimacy um, is something that I think constantly reveals itself to us in different ways every time we attempt it. Um, so I guess I'll just end there and then um, and show this work and, and then we'll keep going. <laughs> I'll be back. Are you color struck? Am I color struck? 
где Саня? But the question is, why? Why? seeing myself. I think about passing myself in the street or out in the world and wonder I remember her saying, like, one time, you have the look. She's like, even if you didn't have the smarts, even if you couldn't do the job, you have the look. And I'm like, I have the look. What does that mean? sounded like mixed up.
Thank you so much for that work, Garrett. And I look forward um, to be able to discuss it more in a couple of minutes. Um, but now I'd like to introduce Claudia Rankin, the author of six collections of poetry, including Citizen and American Lyric and Don't Let Me Be Lonely, three plays, including The White Card and numerous video collaborations. She co-edited the Racial Imaginary Writers on Race in the Life of the Mind and co-founded the Racial Imaginary Institute. Among her many illustrious awards, she is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And she is the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry at Yale University. Her most recent work, Just Us, An American Conversation, is, as she writes in the closing pages of the book, a way of remaining in the quotidian of disturbance of white supremacy at dinner parties and parent-teacher conferences. The deeply intertextual work strings conversations about whiteness with strangers in airports and good friends, together with references to pop culture, history, critical race theory, visual art, evolution, class, and the list goes on. And it is our great pleasure to engage with your work more this evening. So please join me in welcoming to the virtual stage, Claudia Rankin. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be um, with you and Garrett this, this evening. And I wanna thank everyone for putting this event together. I know that I would rather be with each of you individually, but it's nice to collectively know that we were all still standing. And I just wanted to send my prayers to the folks in the Ukraine this very unnecessary war that is going on. Um, I'm going to read, because Garrett um, brought up Big Little Lies, I thought um, I would read that section in um, Just Us. It's, it's a way of, of responding a little bit to Kianga Taylor's Race for Profit, that book, which I recommend to everyone. I also wanna say, I'm actually, um, I, I, I just recently moved from Yale to NYU and I did, um, I just wanna make that slight correction just so we are all in the same um, page in terms of our location. I'm speaking to a white friend about the class breakdown in the television series, Big Little Lies. Economic stability or instability gets communicated by the size and location of the different characters' homes. My friend and I live in similar houses with comparable layouts and approximately the same square footage. This is perhaps why I make the careless mistake of putting us in the same class category as Reese Witherspoon's character in the show. I say, we're represented by the couple whose nice house doesn't overlook anything, water, cliff, or any other natural wonder. This claim hasn't completely left my lips before I'm stalled by the thought that I have no inherited wealth. I didn't have a choice about whether or not to work outside the home while raising my child, as my friend did. And and, and all the differences. I recant as quickly as I claim the twinning based on the similarity of our home's layouts. It's an odd error to have made, but my friend and I do have lives that look similar. Both of us are writers with equivalent educational backgrounds, life traumas and aspirations for ourselves and our families. We have known each other much of our adult lives and perhaps affection and familiarity made me momentarily oblivious to our differences. Our economic histories point in part to our racial histories. Not that there aren't individual blacks wealthier than my friend, but typically, even if we arrived in, this, in the same dorm room, we don't actually wind up in the same place economically since whites have a medium net worth that is 10 times that of blacks. 
our different races have positioned us in the world in radically different ways. Her wealth goes back to the Mayflower and her white Anglo-Saxon positioning is how she explains many things about her life. My own immigration from a previously colonized country, naturalized American citizenship and status as a first generation college educated black woman account for much about me, about me, about me, me. This ultimately destabilizes us because despite our many connections, despite sitting across from each other, we have been pushed out of a structure from opposing ends through the doorway of our shared culture to sit across from each other. I begin to remember all the turbulence and disturbances between us that contributed to the making of this moment of ease and comfort. After my friend's departure, I pick up my mistake like a snow globe and turn it over in my mind. My assumption reminds me of a comment made by a white man on a flight I took. I don't see color. Like him, a lack of discomfort allowed me for a nanosecond to disregard history and the institutional structures put in place to predetermine that my friend and I can never slip on sameness. Was my slip up simply a dis misplaced desire to calcify our connection? Or is there more? Was the slip an otherworldly desire to become my friend, take on the trappings of her white life and form a semblance of equality that can never exist? I understand that my need, even to ask this question, is formulated within a white-centered framework that believes all aspirational life is towards whiteness. The framework of white hierarchy has been behind the making of a culture I am both subject to and within. Consequently, I know how easily my actions could be formed by it. Why not want the thing that offers the most lasting and stable, if at times toxic and dehumanizing value? The life I've made is my life. And though it overlaps with what's also desired by white people like my wasp friend, our houses, for example, there are agendas that build precariousness and trauma into my professional success, into any professional success I have achieved that must remain more primary for me. An essential desire for equity and the ability to live freely without the fear of white terrorism literally trumps everything. As former First Lady Michelle Obama expresses in Becoming, unless something structural shifts in ways that remain unimaginable, the life my friend has is not a life I can achieve, ever. Her kind of security, because it's not merely monetary, is atmospheric and therefore is not transferable. It's what reigns invisible behind the term white. It doesn't inoculate her from illness, loss, or forfeiture of wealth, but it ensures a level of citizenry, safety, mobility, and belonging I can never have. Neither of us is baffled by our particular random, well-earned, unearned, historical, or inherited differences. It is in fact my friend's ability to grasp and hold our differences that creates both our facility with each other and our antagonisms. But why even for a second translate ease with each other into a state of sameness? If no sameness of status is possible, even within my closest white friendships, how to account for closeness? What form of relation can indulge, include knowledge of historical dynamics and societal realities without, without preventing or interrupting intimacy. If similarity and sameness are essentially impossible, how is difference recouped and aligned with closeness? How do we keep all the differences on the table and still call that a friendship? I long to trust 
in our feelings of closeness, a closeness years in the making that wrestled racism and racist assumptions to the surface of our hurt feelings and profound disappointment. I wish to stop time and have feelings of intimacy blanket all time, both historical time and the years that took us from our late twenties to our late fifties. But to stop being conscious of my friends innate advantages is to stop being present inside our relationship. To remember the truth of us is to be in the truth of us in all its realities and all its stumbles and slips. Then our friendship is what allows us to fall away from the ease of intimacy without falling. My friend already knows the truth of her life because I call it forward. Her ability not to push aside the moment of my self-correct, a moment that happens with language, language that seems to distance us from each other in efforts to know precisely, points to her ability to hold and recognize her advantages, her disadvantages, her whiteness, alongside my blackness, my disadvantages, and my advantages, despite our similarities. The two-step just us, no, you and I, that I enacted in one she, I hope, kept in step with, is one I hope she, I hope, kept in step with. I doubt she would have corrected me had I not corrected myself. But that aside, together we allowed racial difference as constructed as it is, as real as it is, not to become for us a source of acrimonious silence. Our fortitude, our resilience with regard to each other's differences becomes in day-to-day -day life, our friendship. Still, when I asked her to respond to an earlier version of this piece, she said she had no thoughts of interest. I kept wondering how she, a writer with a wealth of thoughts and imaginings had suddenly gone bankrupt. So I thought this would be a great place for us to start, um, given um, Garrett's thoughts or question, um, which is how do we deal with what's real while maintaining intimacy? Thank you so much, Claudia. So much, Claudia. And, oh, are you all getting feedback from my voice or is that just me? One second, I think nothing more. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Claudia, and my apologies for the Yale NYU flub. <laughs> um, I just wanted to correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> no problem. I wanted to start with, you know, just sort of not one of the questions I'd curated, but um, just with a question that is sort of in response to really experiencing both of your work just now, which is you both have such an atmospheric and accumulative quality to your work. And so I just wonder how you think about the embodied experience of your readers or viewers um, in, when they're engaging with your work. Should I, should I go for that? I, think. I, I just read, so you go. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's funny, like I, I, you know, on one hand, I feel like I'm making things obviously as a as an offering to people at the same time i don't really think about how they're going to the immediacy of their experience when they're watching the work um and i i really it's really in like my whole process is so dependent i think on what's unknown um that there's something about i guess the atmosphere that it kind of dictates itself, you know, um, and where I am and where they are and and then what the work becomes is, I guess, uh, kind of the more interesting place or maybe the the, un, the most, the least interesting of places actually, you know, it just kind of becomes its own thing. You know, it's like you take a photo and then you put it in the chemicals and it's like magic. It develops and you start to see it right but it's going to be different every time depending on what the chemistry is and um how long you keep it in and and all those things awesome thank you what about you Claudia well 
Well, you know, I was thinking, Gary, you said something um, in an interview I once watched where you talked about the work being an intervention into the cultural consciousness mm -hmm. and that in a way it allows what is there to shift because now you put something there mm -hmm. that you've offered the the and i feel like that cultural consciousness is the embodiment of all of us mm -hmm. you know and and what we believe um um is there is there because we've seen it and and then suddenly we see something else mm -hmm. we see the the first black aviator with a um, international license from from america and suddenly things open up and shift and reroute themselves so i feel like the embodiment happens in 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 sort of broadening the field Mm. Yeah. And with this conversation of broadening the field, um, in your work, both of you have this core tenet of polyvocality. It's not just sort of one narrative, one voice, or one story. And so how for you all is narrative really driven by sort of this chorus as opposed to sort of one solitary voice? Mm. You know, that's interesting because I, I um narrative is something i i think a lot about like and and just even what the definition of of narrative is is it story it can ideas be be narrative um how are the, the people and the the scenarios and circumstances that are that are a part of the work feeding into something as concise as a narrative or a story um i mean i I usually just start with a, a question and I feel like there's 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 so many universes that exist in one question that have their their own their own narrative, you know, and their own way of existing and moving through the world. And then you also then have how people are going to read those things. I mean, I think there's also there's an interest for me in like I've never actually been super interested in myself um, in um, and maybe that's something I'm, it's because I'm intimidated by that, you right? Like maybe as I continue to push myself, I will be more interested in, you know, maybe, maybe I'm evading is what I'm trying to say um, by, by this hyper-focus on looking out. But I, I think particularly in the context of making films, when you really are, you can really only say something one frame at a time, the idea of having multiplicity is both a challenge and also incredible opportunity to expand our understanding of narrative or an idea or like anything really. I, I'm, I'm really interested in the ideas around proximity, you know, that what happens when you put one thing up against another thing, um, which is I think one of the reasons why I love film so much. Um, the, um, the what was it inventory of facts yeah <laughs> that you put together when you did america yeah um, is is such a uh, inspiring idea to me because it it means that all of these things um i know we didn't see that film but it everybody if you haven't seen garrett's America, you got to see it. You, you should just go do not collect $200. <laughs> just get there, watch it. And, um, and I, I think that sense of if one thing lives and crosses and touches another thing, which speaks, goes back to the idea of intimacy, it by its very proximity opens out a new discussion, a new way of seeing, a new way of thinking, a new question to ask. Um, in uh, you know, in your films, Garrett, even the in that film, the word America becomes, for the most part, the most audible word in the in 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 what could be understood as a silent film. And then in AKA, the, the phrase, um, are you color struck? The question, are you color struck? Becomes the, 
the thought, the question that has to be in conversation with every image that we see. And the, we cannot take in the image without that question. Yeah. And so it, it constantly is pushing us back towards um, the relationship between the one thing and the other thing, the utterance and the image. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in that, the juxtapositioning that comes with a kind of multiple use of genre. Mm -hmm. I just want to add really quickly that I think, you know, and I, I don't know if we'll talk so much about like form and content, but I, one of the things, Claudia, that I love about your work is that, yeah, you can, you can listen to it. Someone could read it out loud to you. You could go to Audible, but you also then have this object and that catapults you into this whole other universe around context and the way in which you're understanding exactly what you're talking about. Two things being next to one another and how new meaning then can continue to develop unto itself, you know, in ways that can never be confined. And I actually think, you know, I, I feel like your work really surpasses genre. And that's something that I've sort of defensively talked about in my own work and in mostly because I find the idea of genre to be really bureaucratic and, um, uninteresting, frankly, <laughs> you know, but um, this idea that there's no way to contain the, mul the multitudes of, of a life lived, of thoughts, you know, um, you can't put them in a container. And here's these endless ways in which the conversation can continue to evolve and to grow, both physically and as memory, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that because I think it's important for anyone who also doesn't maybe have the physical book to definitely also get the physical book. We're just going to shot each other out, but I had to say that because it's important. Well, you know, I think I think there is overlap in, in in the methodology and in the practice. Yeah, and something that you all you both are sort of bringing up right now, Claudia, you said something about your interest in proximity and what happens when two things are put in conversation with each other. And we see that in what Garrett's talking about, the physical construction of the book. You can, I'm assuming what's on Audible is, or when you listen to the audiobook, is just the right side of the page, the portion that she read for us this evening. But there's all this, um, there's images, there are notes, there's this intertextual um, conversation that's happening on the left side of the page. And sometimes those pages are blank. And so it really is this like multi-layered way of engaging with the book. And Garrett, in your, like in AK, we see mothers and daughters layered on top of each other, different mothers and daughters, like coming into our visual presence layered on top of each other. And so I would love if you all could also just talk about your process of composition. We have a lot of students who are writers here joining us tonight. And so the the and a lot of students of film and I just am interested in how you all are composing um, these projects and creating these multiple layers of engagement for your audiences. Um, well, I guess I'll, I can just mention. I mean, a lot of the 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 actual scenes that you're seeing in AKA came out of again a direct question um, around you know if you could describe your relationship with your mother in a still picture, what would that be? Um, and so you're actually seeing their answers and it, and it, so there's a really, there's a, a real sense of just simplicity to that in terms of process. Um, there are other moments where, you know, someone might say, well, I spent so much time tanning myself or I spent so much time thinking about how I shouldn't be in the sun, right? And then that elicits its own kind of image and action. Um, and I think that that's been kind of important for me, you know, also working in a, you know, I, I was just kind of like shitting on genre, but I'll just say like working in a journalistic, you know, docu documentary space, which is where I got a lot of my first opportunities, you know, you really kind of, um, you hit a ceiling to a certain extent when you allow your imagination to run, it actually becomes unethical to do that, right? Um, and so this was also kind of, an interesting way, I think, in which I found myself absorbing fact, factual information, and 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 just as Claudia mentioned in America as well, but but wanting to have a space where I could add, I could add to that in a way that was that was additive to the folks that were involved, and and that also felt morally okay. Actually, not that 
I mean, morality is maybe not the right word, but felt ethical. You know, one of the things, one of my favorite moments in, um, I, I spend a lot of time listening to you talk <laughs> about your, your work. And um, one of the things that I was really um, taken with was when you talked about how in your feature film time, you had shot that and thought, oh, um, I'm gonna go now for six months and edit it into a film. And um, the subject of the film showed up with all of this footage mm -hmm. that would reroute what you had maybe thought you were about to go and do and expand that, that world. And how that there was never a sense of like, oh, this is not gonna be in there. It's, it's gonna be in there and we're gonna have to open up the process to include it. And so I, I, I feel like that impulse that the page or whatever, the film, the whatever it is one is making could leave space for additions, for um, accidents, for a thing that came late to the party, um, an event that happened um, while you were making whatever you were making is, is always a structure I'm looking for. If the structure doesn't give me a third way to use your phrase there, mm. then there's something wrong with the structure in, 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 in the world that I live. Because I, I, I think part of um, what I'm always interested in is in making a thing that can bring in real time, mm. that can hold real time and a structure that's strong enough to be itself and be um, open to the introduction of new things, mm. including the consciousness of the reader mm -hmm. <laughs> as one of those things that might come through. Mm. I feel that just, I was gonna say just briefly that I feel like the books are so cinematic in that way. You know, they really are, um, I mean, everyone, some people have really strong feelings about voiceover, you know, I think it was, um, Anthony Hopkins, or no, Dennis Hopper, who said that, um, voiceover is lazy and because, you know, because it doesn't force you to sort of tell a story through action and through behavior. And I feel obviously quite differently because I, I love voiceover and it creates this space for there to be both internal and external existence, which is how we experience the world. And um, I don't know, I just wanted to add to that, but I just think that the, you know, the work really allows you to feel both guided in, in, in both spaces, you know, um, in observation and in, in direct, direct experience. And, and I just want to say too, there's just so much humor. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I just, there's like so much, I, I laughed so much in reading Justice. Like I just like, and I don't know if that's something that's talked about a lot, but I, um, I, I'm going to just put it out there that I think that there's a lot of deep humor in it <laughs> as well. I have a good time. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> we can share that. Yeah. Well, in that vein of sort of like your experience with the work, having a good time working on it, and Garrett, you said something about the ethics of the work you're doing. I'm really interested in this negotiation between the personal and the professional. I know, Garrett, you said like, you know, I'm not interested in looking inward right now, I'm looking outward, but there's still sort of like this very personal and deep intimate space that you're walking into. I think of that, um, some of those final moments of time in which the, the couple is intimate in the backseat of a, of a car and being filmed in that moment. And so I think about that. I, and for Claudia, I think I, I, about the relationships that you are discussing in this project, friendships, um, your daughter, your husband. Um, and so I just wonder if you all could talk about how you negotiate that ethical space between the personal and the work that you're doing that the world sees. Well, you know, it's funny because um, people have said to me, oh, 
you've written about your friends and your husband and your family and your daughter. And I don't feel like I have really. I feel like I feel like I've written about those moments in my life that I share with the all of life. Mm -hmm. That um, that the decision to include a thing is the decision to join in <laughs> with the kinds of investigations that belong to all of us. Um, so to me, it never really feels that personal. It feels, um, it feels real because it really happened, <laughs> but it also feels very public. Like these are moments that are, um, that I could find in your, in your real house or in someone else's real house. Um, the things that are really personal, um, that feel really personal, they don't show up anywhere else. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I would have to agree. I mean, I think I, I really resonates with me this idea that when, when we're making things that it's, it's, it's for the world, you know? And I mean, I, I truly have said, I feel like Claudia, you've, you can heal the whole world with your work just because you're offering a, as you say, like a, a sort of transparent roadmap for how to get there, you know? And I don't really see, you know, I, I don't like being so definitive in, in my language, but I, I don't really, I think, see the point of making something if it isn't for people, if it isn't for the world, you know? And I think, you know, especially for young folks who are who might torture themselves before they even get started on, on what to make, I always, you know, just say, I mean, um, what is it that you want to give? You know, it can be as simple as that. And, and it doesn't, and you don't have to give one particular thing. There aren't rules on what you can give. But I think that giving and generosity are at the crux of, of all great things. And, um, and certainly it's, it's the beginning of my rationale. And also Gary, you said this thing that I, I taped up above my desk because I think it's worth remembering every day. You talked about that, the fact that you wanted a structure, you wanted to make structures that had as part of them forgiveness, that allowed for forgiveness. And I, I, I wanted that reminder in my life as, um, as a structural reminder. Mm. I, I can think about it. I think you probably were talking about time because we're, we're you know, thinking about mass incarceration and the punitive um, ways in which um, that continues um, slavery in the United States. But, but I love thinking about it as a sort of poetics mm. in the act of making that whatever structure one is involved with constructing or building within the work has as its, not even a destination, but as its um, cell making, mm. uh, a kind of um, commitment to forgiveness. Mm. Yeah, we, you know, I mean, that also brings me back, I think, to just something I was mentioning earlier that I, I really, I feel like is at the crux of both of our processes, which is like also being wrong, you know, and being wrong, obviously being connected to forgiveness. And I don't think, I don't think we, at least in Western culture, have a framework for how to deal with being wrong or how to even approach the possibility of it you know and and I, and that's where I think art comes in you know if 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 it's not institutionalized that's that's where art can come in you know 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is, I, I agree with that, that the, we are so committed to being right that we lose the humanity of people in that. Um, you know, somebody said to me recently, um, um, they asked me if I had seen um, America. Yes, America. And I said, no, I hadn't, but I had. <laughs> but I couldn't remember and I didn't want to say yes and be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Because, and I realize I do that a lot. I would rather say no than yes and then be wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then claim something that I don't immediately own fully. Yeah. Um, because I like the idea that I went back and rewatched America and thought, oh no, we've seen this. <laughs> and, and then I was right. But, uh, you know, so. I, I think I think I, we we have been taught that you can't admit not knowing you can't admit, admit that you're messy around the thinking of a thing that you're you're in process right um, towards things you have to have arrived every year mm -hmm. yes exactly and, you know. I, you know, I'm just slogging along over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both for all of your generous commentary and feedback. We are nosing up to 7 p.m. already, which feels awful because I could continue to listen to you all. I didn't really even need to be here. I could just listen to you all talk all evening. So thank you so much for the, the feedback that you're giving our students, the commentary about your work. I love this conversation about giving ourselves the permission to be wrong and to fail. Um, what a truth student needs, need to hear from two people and two practitioners who are at the top of their field. So thank you so much for offering that to all of the students. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to Jesse Greenewalt and our interpreters who are here this evening. Um, a special thank you to my fellow Slack members or Slackers as we call ourselves, Jennifer Blackburn, Andrew Chotala, Matt Donovan, James Allen Hall, and Roy Kesey. But again, a huge thank you to you both for being willing to share some of your work and for sharing yourselves in this conversation. We are so greatly appreciative. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I'm like, it could go on forever. Let's go get drinks or something. I'll see you guys downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night. Have a great evening, everyone. You too.